For Armenians, the problem is not fairness, it's love. If God really loves, then he would do everything he could to make it possible for all to be saved and not lock some out from salvation from the beginning. Well, see, again, I think that that is bringing our presuppositions of A, how bad the situation is, and B, how God has to respond in that situation. We're enemies of God. We're hostile to God. If we got what we want, we would all be in hell. On this edition of the White Horse Inn, part two of For or Against Calvinism, a conversation between Michael Horton and Roger Olson. Five centuries ago, in taverns and public houses across Europe, the masses would gather for discussion and debate over the latest ideas sweeping the land. From one such meeting place, a small Cambridge inn called the White Horse, the Reformation came to the English-speaking world. Carrying on the tradition, welcome to the White Horse Inn. What we've learned so far is that Calvinists talk a lot longer than Arminians do. <clears throat> Apologize, Dr. Olson. The uh, questions are coming fast and furious on Twitter. I'm sorry, we probably won't get to the question about the Nephilim, but uh, I do appreciate your uh, willingness to keep offering questions. Uh, at this point, uh, we're going to turn it over to our two guests to uh, go back and forth a little bit. And after about uh, 30 minutes or so, I'll come back up and uh, try to uh, gently interrupt. But uh, Dr. Olson, you've got the first question. Well, Mike, that was a great sermon. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I almost had an altar call. I, I thought you were going to give an altar call. Uh, there were a lot of points there. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't my first question, but just my first comment, and that is that uh, you might have noticed in my book Against Calvinism that I almost never mention you. <laughs> and the reason is because there are a lot more aggressive Calvinists than you are. And uh, I quote them at length. So if you're wondering, you know, uh, if I engage with other Calvinists, I certainly do. And it's not because he's not a good representative. He's the best, in my opinion. But there are people out there representing or misrepresenting Calvinism uh, very publicly that I'm not even sure he'd agree with on some of the points that they promote very strongly. I agreed with about, I don't know, maybe 75% of what you said over there, you know? And that might surprise many in our audience. When I describe my Arminianism to my students, the almost universal reaction is, that sounds like Calvinism. And uh, that doesn't surprise me, because uh, even John Wesley said that they're only a hair's breadth apart, at some points, at some points. And at other points, they're worlds apart, of course. Uh, but I really appreciated what you had to say over there, and, and our uh, 20 years of conversation have been invigorating and informative and the reason I don't refer to him much in my book is because we really agree with each other on so much, but there are points we obviously don't agree on also. But I, I engage more with Bettner and uh, Spruill and Piper and others who are, I would say, at least put the emphasis a little differently than you do at some points. I'm not sure you really disagree, but the emphasis is what I'm talking about on double predestination, for example. Um, so my first question. How do you reconcile God's goodness and love with your belief that God could save all because election is unconditional and grace is effectual, but he does not? Put another way, how do you reconcile God's goodness and love with your belief that God foreordained and rendered certain the fall of humanity and all its consequences, including eternal hell for some? Starting with a really Soft softball. softball. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, I think that, yes, yeah, so we, we, we do come to the Bible with some presuppositions. I remember throwing my Bible across the room when I hit Romans 9. And I thought, this is going to require a paradigm shift that I don't, I'm not prepared to make. And it ha slowly, it seeped in, and I, I had to adjust. And then I started seeing passages all over the place. I think at the end of the day, I can't tell God ahead of time what he can tell me about himself 
that jibes with my moral experience. At some point, I just have to say, this is a decision about whether I believe these passages are true and whether I'm interpreting them correctly. And if I am interpreting them correctly, I have to allow my assumptions to be judged. But then the second thing I would say in response is, and it's really a question, if you believe that God foreknows infallibly that some will not be saved, even knows, foreknows who will not be saved, and decides, I think you even use the word choose, chooses not to intervene, not to do otherwise when he could, how does that help your position out of that? Is that your first question? <laughs> Did you sure. spend one of your questions? <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah, well, I get asked that a lot, of course, and I've, I've thought about that and wrestled with it. And, of course, my open theist friends use that, too. So yeah. I feel pulled, you know, by open theist friends and Calvinist friends on that particular issue. That's one place they agree, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. They say, let's just... There is no foreknowledge, of uh, exhaustive foreknowledge. Right. right, but the Calvinists and the open theists agree that this is a problem for classical Arminianism. And I'm always willing to admit there are mysteries, things that I don't fully understand. But one thing I would say about this is that it seems to me like when Calvinists and open theists bring this up to me, they're imagining that God kind of looks at what might happen and then decides to create and thereby instantiates one thing that might happen. And that's not how I look at it. I, I do look at it in a way that I can't fully explain, and that, that is that when God decides to create the world, this is the world he gets. So when, when for example, R.C. Sproul, you, you quote R.C. Sproul to the effect that God decrees to permit the fall, for example. Right. And you say, I think it was even in the same context, God chooses to allow the fall. So... How different, is it just semantics, how different is it to say God decreed to allow the fall versus God chose to permit the fall? It sounds like the same. I don't want to give it away too much that's in my book. People might not want to buy it, you know, but uh, I'll, say, I'll, I'll just say that I answer that in my book. Can I get away with that? <laughs> You're good. You're no, good. no, no, I can't get away with that. I can tell. So, um, you know, this is one reason I, I interact with certain Calvinists and not others in my book, because the ones I interact with go further than just saying God permits or allows. Uh, it's clear that they mean effectual permission, and they all explain it this way, that God decreed the fall and rendered it certain. In other words, it was in his plan. He wanted this to happen, and he rendered it certain by withdrawing the grace they would have needed not to fall. Edward says that. Bettner says that. I believe at some place Spruill says that. I'd have to go back to my book and find the exact page. But most of the Calvinists I interact, interact with in my book explain it that way, whereas Arminians would never explain it that way. And Reformed people wouldn't either. I, I mean, R.C. Sproul, I'm pretty sure, doesn't. But Edwards got that from Augustine. And I, I mean, this is one point where I think it's a very valuable thing to clarify. Reformed theology typically... Uh, even ever since Calvin rejected that Augustinian medieval doctrine of the donum superaditum that basically, uh, this is the idea that Adam needed grace to stay on his feet. And the, the illustration I usually give in class is that God created a ladder and said, Adam, uh, you go ahead and climb it. And then when he got to about the next to uh, last rung, he kicked it out from underneath him and he fell. And Calvin says very, very clearly, that makes God the author of evil. It's traditional Reformed theology to reject the donum superaditum, the necessity of grace before the fall, mm -hmm. to uphold Adam, uh, because God actually created him in perfect righteousness and holiness and justice, perfectly capable of fulfilling that command until after the fall. Well, that helps, Mike, um, but I do think that more Calvinists than you think say that, and I go through them in my book and make a major point of it, that this is a real hang-up for yeah. Arminians. But also, in almost For Calvinists, every... too. But I wish that there weren't Calvinists who sometimes said that. Right. Like Bettner and Edwards. But there's also the problem of the doctrine of, of providence. In the Calvinist systems that I've read, and I, I quote them in my book, 
uh, in the doctrine of providence, it seems to me they make it impossible that Adam, even before the fall, had free will in the sense Arminians believe in, which is power of contrary choice. Because in most Calvinist systems, that simply doesn't exist. Well, and there, it's not because of the sovereignty of God. One thing that I think a lot of people, even sometimes Calvinists, sort of just learn the five points, miss, is that free will is not a question uh, in relation to God's sovereignty. We're not, our, our wills are not bound because God is sovereign. Our wills are bound because of sin. God, this is, this is where we get to the, the relationship between God and human beings being analogical. Or an analogy. Now, this is, gets, gets into thick water here, but uh, Thomas Aquinas helped develop this. The Reformed Orthodox developed it based on, really, the teaching of the early Greek fathers that God is incomprehensible and reveals himself according to his works, not according to his essence. God is qualitatively different from us, not quantitatively. And because he's qualitatively different from us, even in terms of agency, God never bumps into us. We never bump into God. God is always sovereign, always superintending, but not coercing. And one danger, I think, with some presentations that I would characterize as hyper-Calvinistic, and I think a lot of Arminians also fall into this, there would be agreement between hyper-Calvinists and Arminians, is sort of seeing freedom as a freedom pie. God has a bigger share, and Calvin, hyper-Calvinists and Arminians over, argue over who has the larger share. But the classic Reformed position that we share with Thomas Aquinas and the Dominicans is that actually God has his own pie, and in him we live and move and have our freedom. Uh, we ha our, our freedom is creaturely freedom. His freedom is creator freedom, and we're not vying for it. God doesn't have to limit himself. God cannot restrict any of his attributes, including his sovereignty. But he gives us our own creaturely liberty, our own creaturely free will, and our confessions, our classic reform systems say that Adam fell by his own free will. So free will after the fall is another problem. Well, again, I go through this in my book in, in a lot of detail, and I don't mention you because I, I don't know, you know, you may not agree with the Calvinist authors that I quote, but if you mentioned Calvin just a little bit ago, and I should have said this then, this is why I'm not a good debater, because it always comes to me later. Um, Calvin explicitly denies uh, permission, God's permission. He says we should not use permission, language of God. God never merely permits anything. And a lot of that is because Balzac and people he was up against in Geneva who were challenging him on these points, he, just, he was just you know, a thoroughgoing Augustinian on these points, but critics of Calvin were saying uh, that basically God just sits idly by as a spectator when these things happen. And so that drew him to emphasize, look, this is not a bare permission as if, in Luther's way of putting it to Erasmus, as if God were on a vacation or had gone to a feast while the world is running. No, it is a, it is a permission that is actually a determination. God determines to allow this, that, or the other thing. But again, I'm not sure that Arminians aren't really saying that God determines to allow certain things because if he didn't determine to allow it, it wouldn't... What Arminians say is that God determines to allow, but his allowing does not determine. All right? Okay. His permission of the fall was not determinative of the fall. It was not in God's plan that the fall happened, but God allowed it. It was in his consequent will, not his antecedent will. Well, for instance, in the Canons of Dort, I keep quoting, it says that God does not cause the guilt and sin and damnation of the reprobate, but he does cause the salvation of the elect. Mm -hmm. And so there's a difference there between leaving people in their sin and deciding to leave people in their sin in their self-chosen way uh, and what he has to do for the elect, which is namely, because they're in the same condition as the reprobate, namely, overcome their resistance with the beauty and glory of Christ and give his Holy Spirit to draw us to his Son and so forth. And then you bring us back to my question and then I'll let you have at it. 
why doesn't he do that for everyone? You will ask me, is God therefore unjust? For who can resist his will? No, but no, for me the issue is to... not justice, but love. I keep emphasizing that, and Calvinists don't seem to understand that for Arminians, the problem is not fairness, it's love. If God really loves, then he would do everything he could to make it possible for all to be saved and not lock some out from salvation uh, from the beginning because he foreordained it. Well, see, again, I think that that is bringing our presuppositions of A, how bad the situation is, and B, how God has to respond in that situation. We're enemies of God. We're hostile to God. We have revolted against God. If we got what we want, we would all be in hell. Uh, and so we, we start from, the, from ground zero of condemnation of the whole human race. But God so loved the world that he chose many. Christ died for many. The Holy Spirit calls many. And whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Just as you can say that the whole world, Peter says, the whole world was saved through Noah. Although Peter says seven in all. Uh, just as you can say Judah was saved through a remnant. Just as you can say the whole world is saved through Revelation 5.9. Christ dying for people from every tribe, kindred, tongue, people, and nation. The world really is saved through that remnant. But you didn't answer my question. <clears throat> well, is it loving for God? Is it loving for God to give his mercy to some and not others? If unconditionally. It, unconditionally. If it's not then it's not mercy. Because the whole definition of mercy hangs on the propriety of God not giving it. He is free to give it to whomever he will, or it wouldn't be mercy. It wouldn't be grace. Yeah. Of course, you know that Arminians believe in prevenient grace. Right. And and that was going to be one of my questions. Okay, go ahead. All right. So, you, so in Arminian theology, a partial regeneration... Pre, does precede conversion, but it is not a complete regeneration. Okay, prevenient grace then carves out space between death and life. Where is such a limbo described or even assumed in Scripture when in contrast, this is getting to be a rhetorical question, isn't it? <laughs> it seems from passages like Ephesians 2 yeah. that while we were dead, Paul says, not while we were in limbo, but while we were, not while we were partially regenerate, but while we were dead, he made us alive together with Christ by grace you were saved. Yeah. Everywhere that scripture talks about God drawing us, I interpret that, and all Arminians interpret that, John Wesley, uh, as prevenient grace. Uh, there are lots of good concepts that are right theologically that are not named as such in scripture, and I'm sure you'd agree with me about that. The Trinity is one. So Arminians simply read scripture and see prevenient grace everywhere there, assumed, and Calvinists don't, I guess. I don't know how else to explain it, but I've always read scripture that way as describing the relationship between God and the sinner as God wooing, drawing, enabling. Uh, prevenient grace is, is that which uh, makes it possible for us to respond to God out of his mercy. But it's not... Um, you know, it doesn't, uh, it's not effectual in the sense of bringing about our salvation, but making it possible. But it presupposes this condition then, or not presupposes, prevenient grace creates this condition of partial regeneration. Where is the idea of partial regeneration found in Scripture, even implicitly? Yeah. Well... <clears throat> Theologically, I think it's uh, presupposed in Scripture wherever it talks about our making a choice because obviously we're bound in sin. Our wills are bound. That's one thing we agree on. We agree on total depravity. Arminians do, not just me, but Arminians and Calvinists agree on total depravity. Therefore, if God is a loving God, uh, he would make it possible for people to be saved and not, well, you don't like the word coerce, uh, but... Um, irresistibly or effectually draw them and leave others out. So it must be up to us, ultimately, if God is love. So it's an inference, a logical yes. inference. right. Oh. As I think limited atonement is. 
in Calvinism because I can't find it anywhere in Scripture. What about all those passages? <laughs> Nobody thought they meant that until Gottschalk in the 8th century and then Beza after Calvin. Oh, uh, well, we, I, I could differ with you on okay. that just a little bit, but... Uh, <laughs> I can't find anyone before Gottschalk who believed in... Well, in Jesus. The, oh, oh. <laughs> you know? All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, could I ask you, have I already used up my No, questions? go ahead. This um, is fun. Okay, it is fun. I, th I thought before I talked to you that Arminians... Not without exception. For instance, Wesley would be an exception. Arminius himself would be an exception. But that Boy, those are two big exceptions. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Aside from that, almost the only two Arminians in history. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's part of the problem for us in trying to... Uh, it's I easy understand. for us to make mistakes because right. I read Miley, Wiley, and Watson, standard evangelical Arminians, and they say... We cannot accept the, the penal substitutionary view of the atonement because that would lead us either to universalism or Calvinism. Mm -hmm. First of all, why do you think that is a default setting? And two, how do you affirm substitutionary atonement without affirming that uh, it, either universalism or... So, so you mean you're seeing the governmental theory as the default Armenian view? Right. Okay. Yeah, I answer that in my book, Armenian Theology, Myths and Realities. It's one of the myths because Arminius clearly believed in the satisfaction theory of the atonement. He agreed with Anselm. Wesley clearly believed in the penal substitution mm -hmm, right. theory. And yep. some of the Methodists of the 19th century, you mentioned, you rattled off several, and I know that Miley believed in the governmental theory. Uh, but I know that Summers um, believed in the penal substitution theory and argued against. So there were 19th century, I go through them in my book, Armenian Theology. I still hold to the uh, penal substitution theory, so that's the question that you're asking me. How can I avoid universalism if I believe in the penal substitution theory? Yeah, well, that's why hell is so horribly tragic, because it's absolutely unnecessary. Christ has already suffered the penalty for all of our sins. That seems clear to me in Scripture, and I can't imagine a good God sending his son to die for only some of the people he created. So hell is what we choose. It's not what God chooses for us. Um, so, yeah, it's like, it's like when Jimmy Carter declared, you know, to the Vietnam War resistors who went to Canada, uh, he said, you can come back. They didn't all come back. They could have. Um, everyone can be saved. They choose not to be. And you said in your talk something about this. You said you were saved when Jesus died on the cross. But even Calvin doesn't say that. Calvin says that we're not saved until the benefit of Christ's cross is applied to us when the gift of faith is received. So it's not really until conversion that you're saved. The cross guarantees it or secures it is John Piper's favorite term. Although he even slips sometimes and says that he was saved when Christ died on the cross. So I don't think that's good Calvinist theology to say you were saved when Christ died on the cross. I would beg to differ. I think Calvin very clearly says that he saved us at the cross, but none of that would have been of any significance of any, or any relevance, Calvin says, had it not been the case that the Holy Spirit applied that salvation to us and gave us the faith to embrace it and united us to Christ. To have Christ die for us outside of us 2,000 years ago in history, Calvin says, is the, is, that is our salvation. But if we are disconnected from him, unless we're united to him by faith, uh, we have no life, and that's why... So when does so, your individual salvation occur? Well, I would talk about coming to faith. That, you know, justification is something that, that happens when I believe, when I trust in Christ, but even that faith is a gift. Mm-hmm. And so when, by the grace of God, I believe I am justified, then sanctification is a lifelong process, and then glorification is the instantaneous eschatological consummation of my salvation. So I, I have been saved, am being saved, will be saved. But to talk about salvation in the past 
referring it to Christ's redemptive work, I think it's just consistent with all of the passages that say he saved his people from their sins. He redeemed us with his blood. He propitiated the wrath of God. All of those for whom he died are guaranteed to be with God forever. I don't think that's what most people think saved means when you say something like no, I did. Agree. So that's a little misleading for most people, I think. But I do hear Calvin say it a lot, but I don't think it's exactly what they mean. I think that's, but that's part of, I think, what, what we as, as Reformed people are trying to challenge Arminians and other non-Calvinists on, that there's a tendency in, in non, let's just say, in synergistic theologies, where we cooperate with God in our salvation, there's a tendency, at least, to locate our salvation in our response to the gospel rather than in the gospel itself. The good news is not repent and believe. The good news is who Jesus is and what he has done. The command to repent and believe is the proper response to the gospel. But I think a lot of evangelicals today confuse those two and it, basically getting saved is something I do. Yeah. We're talking about God getting us saved in history. But when I listened to your answer to my question, I could resonate with it. Uh, growing up Arminian, I heard both. I heard preachers, evangelists, and others say, I was saved. If you're a Christian, you were saved the moment Christ died on the cross. I heard that growing up. But then, of course, we believe that without the personal appropriation of that in faith, we wouldn't be saved. But that Christ's death is what actually saves us, not our faith. Would they have told non-Christians as well that they are saved? No. Would there have been a good reason not to unless you were a Calvinist? They would have said Christ's death on the cross does everything that makes it possible for you to be saved. All you have to do is accept it and then you are saved by his death on the cross. All right. I, I, we, we're done. We're, yeah. <laughs> it's solved. <laughs> See, this is the interesting thing about these dialogues, that um, for a while, you agree on so much. And then all of a sudden, there's that flashing disagreement, yeah. light of disagreement. Yeah, here are the along. cleavages, and that's right. what's good to see, at yeah. least where we disagree properly. Not yeah. on but, I, but I think we, need, we both recognize this. I don't know if you want to admit this or not, but um, <laughs> there are people out there who call themselves Arminians that I would repudiate as not Arminian. And you know that because I've written about at least one in Modern Reformation. <laughs> at least I think he calls himself an Arminian. People think he's an Arminian. I think there are Calvinists too who are popularizing Calvinism in a way I don't recognize as classical Reformed theology in the way they emphasize certain things and repudiate all other positions as heretical or at least nearly heretical. I, I, you don't have to answer. That's <laughs> my little sermon to you. I, I will say this. I will say this. I won't name any names, but you know what I'm talking about. I think, our, I think, I, I think though, uh, that one thing that I hope doesn't happen in the next few years is that we waste so much time and energy on who is being more offensive, the Arminians or the Calvinists. Because I think, you know, there are a lot of Arminians who are saying their God is the devil and so forth. I think that, that, that there's enough to go around. I have never heard some of the people I think you're thinking about <laughs> say that anything remotely like Arminians aren't Christians or Arminians don't believe the gospel. I do think that sometimes there is a tendency to select one person out uh, I'll go ahead and say, Jonathan Edwards, for example. Uh, Jonathan Edwards is a great American theologian. I learned a lot from Jonathan Edwards. For instance, his, his freedom of the will, uh, I think that's a great argument for our freedom being doing what we want. And what we want is, is shaped by who we are, what our nature is. Great, great arguments there. I've learned a lot from Edwards, but I've also learned from Charles Hodge and others that there are places in Jonathan Edwards where he's just off. You know, he does kind of verge on omnicausalism, 
But so did a lot of Roman Catholics. He got some of that from, like Nicholas Malebranche. Occasionalism, every moment is an ex nihilo creation. Well, that's yeah. a strange view. Malebranche's Roman Catholic uh, critics thought it was a strange view. And Reformed people thought it was a strange view when Edwards said it. So we've got to, I think, balance what Edwards says together with the whole... The, the idea is don't go to Mike Horton or to any leader you can think of today who's a lot better known than I am. Don't go to those people. And don't go to Jonathan Edwards and say, I know Reformed theology now because I've gone to these people. Go to the Reformed confessions, mm -hmm. the Westminster Standards and the Three Forms of Unity. That's really where the church came together, not really smart people. But the church came together and said, this is what we believe. And they hashed it over and they debated it. And they said, this is our, consens our consensus. This is what we confess. Let's give our conversation partners a hand. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, feel free to keep sending them in. Uh, some of you have followed directions and have identified who you want to answer your question. Uh, some of you are just posing general questions, so uh, we'll try to make it through as many as possible. Uh, Dr. Olson, the first question is for you. Is unbelief a sin, and did Jesus die for it? And if he didn't die for it, why are people still going to hell yeah. because they don't believe? Well, I think I've heard that question about a hundred times. Um, yes, unbelief is a sin. Yes, Christ died for it. And as I was saying to Mike, uh, for those of us who believe in universal atonement, which is, by the way, necessary for me to not think of God as a monster, and I know that sounds offensive, but what I'm saying is, if I didn't believe in universal atonement, I would have to think God is a monster. I'm not saying you think God is a monster. I'm saying I would have to, and that's why I'm not a Calvinist. Um, yes, Christ died for the sin of unbelief, which is what makes hell so absolutely tragic that it's so absolutely unnecessary. It is what we choose. And C.S. Lewis said there are two kinds of people, those who say to God, not my will but thine be done, and those to whom God says, not my will but thine be done. Dr. Horton, in the Calvinistic view, are the unsaved predestined or preordained to hell? I'm glad I didn't get the Nephilim question. <laughs> uh, Give us that one. Well, yeah, That's easier. Right, yeah. We don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, pro or read so, I don't, I'm not sure what the question is. If it's predestined or preordained? That's correct. Uh, yeah, really, pro, pro orizo is the Greek uh, word we're looking at there, and it, it, to for horizon, uh, to predetermine, these are just synonyms. Okay. Dr. Olson, uh, do you have a scripture on your Kindle there? <laughs> I have the whole Bible on All my right. Kindle. All uh, right. Someone has asked if you wouldn't mind looking at John chapter 6, verses 35 through 44, and just giving a quick... Uh, exegesis of that from your point of view. <laughs> Quick exegesis. Let's see, it's 11.20, my time. No. Uh, why don't you just if read it like to me? If you'd like the podium to preach, that would be here, okay. What, what do they say it says? <laughs> uh, all it is is a, a, to ask for a quick exegesis of John 6, uh, those verses 35 through 44. Those whom the Father draws come to me. No one can come to me, but the Father draws them. Is that it? Yeah, I believe I so, so, yes. Okay. Uh, of course, I believe that. Arminians swear by that prevenient grace no one can come to Jesus without being or to the Father without being drawn by the Holy Spirit I mean people don't understand that Arminians believe in prevenient grace it's the drawing of God it's just that we can say no but no one I mean we're not Pelagians we're not Pelagians. no in fact to be to be fair to be fair the Lutherans also hold that view so it's not just yeah. an Arminian position right Dr. Orton, uh, there is a, uh, another question about the problem of evil here. Um, I know it's one that you've said that both you and Dr. Olson share, but can you give a, uh, a brief Calvinistic uh, defense of how God, or explanation, I should say, of, of how God doesn't actively ordain evil, mm -hmm. but at the same time allows it to happen, mm -hmm. is in control of the outcome, mm 
is even in control of the people who act out in evil ways. Yeah, this is where I, I think it's ironic um, that Calvinists are sometimes called rationalists. When, in my view, Arminians are more rationalistic on this point than Calvinists. And let me explain why, and then Roger can... More reasonable, yes, but... <laughs> That's not what I mean. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, uh, you know, basically, here's, here's what I think we ought to do, whether we call ourselves Calvinists or Arminians or whatever. We ought to go to the scriptures and say, if my theological system can't do justice to all of the passages the relevant passages to this discussion, I need to rethink the system. Because reality is scripture. Our systems are an attempt to understand it. And so we have to, at least, in the best mainstream tradition of Reformed theology of, of, of uh, evangelical Calvinism, the, the, the attempt has been to say, look, we have these passages running from Genesis to Revelation that tell us that God works everything after the counsel of his own will, that that even includes sinful acts. And yet God has a different purpose for that than the sinful perpetrators. Genesis 50 is one example with uh, Joseph who, uh, you know, his brothers come to him and he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God didn't just allow it passively. God had an intention in allowing it. And see, I think that's the difference from the Arminian view. The Arminian view says, yes, God allows it. And unless he allowed it, it wouldn't happen. We agree with that. But the Calvinist goes on and says, he allowed it for a reason. There's purpose. As horrendous as the Holocaust is, and as much as we cannot explain why God allowed the Holocaust to happen, there was a purpose, and that's the only thing that keeps me from thinking that God is a moral monster for allowing it. Can I follow up? Please, with go ahead. I've always wanted Thank to you. ask, um, but where did people's sinful intentions come from? Themselves. But in most Calvinist systems, in the doctrine of providence, it says, they say that um, God controls everything without exception. I'm sure you've read Doesn't Paul say controls. Helm. Oh, Paul Helm does. Well, he shouldn't. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Overseas, superintends, those are all But that seems typical. to be so Arminian. <laughs> no, the difference is that God actually decides to allow something, whereas it sounds like what you're saying no, no. is that God... No, we believe God decides to allow it. In fact, Arminius believed in the doctrine of, of uh, God's having to cooperate uh, with people's decisions and actions or else they wouldn't be able to make them. I'm not sure I agree with that, but that's what Arminius believed. Here, 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 for instance, this is the language of the canons of Dort, just on, the, on reprobation. It doesn't talk about the whole of providence, but he softens the hearts of his elect and inclines them to trust in Christ while he leaves the non-elect in his just judgment to their own wickedness and obduracy. The triune God actively saves the elect Others are passed by in the eternal decree and left to their misery. Mm -hmm. And that's the language of our confessions. They're, they're passed by. It's not just God sitting idly by. He determines it, but he has a purpose. He has a reason. I think this might be one of the biggest differences, and I'm not sure. Help me out here. But in Arminian theology, sin has no purpose. And I think in Calvinism, sin has a purpose. Yes. Okay. There's a huge difference. If I believe that sin has a purpose... Or God has a purpose for right. sin. Well, that, that's what I mean. Right. Uh, then I would have to think God is a monster. He works there, all things together for our good. How does, how does that happen? How does he work all things together for our good? He can even bring sin into line with a purpose and will. That doesn't mean it has intrinsically a purpose that he has an intention for that in that act. When it happens, he can, he can work it out into his overall plan and will. He can overcome it. But what about Genesis 50, for example, or Acts 2, where it actually says God did have an intention in the act of the brother's treachery? Yeah, Joseph's story. Well, of course, Arminians and the Greek church fathers 
uh, who were actually Armenians before Armenians, um, <laughs> believed that that's a reference to God's allowing it, that God had a purpose in allowing it, that God didn't plan it. But well then, if he had a purpose in allowing it, I just don't understand how that relieves Arminians any more of the burden of God's involvement. See, Armenians do believe that God is involved. We, we're not deists. We don't believe God is just watching from a distance, you know, Bette Midler's song or something like that. Uh, God is <laughs> Or the wind between, beneath our wings. Uh, no, yeah. that, not that either. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's really hard to put your finger on exactly what the difference is sometimes because we use the same language, but I know there's a difference. <laughs> but I think one of the biggest differences is that we say sin and evil have no purpose. But God, in his good purpose, can work good out of them. When God foreknows that they will happen, does he already have a purpose for it? And is his glory He has a purpose part of that. for what he will do with them. But they're not part of his plan. How would he have a purpose for what he will do with them without that being part of his plan? Well, again, it comes back to the mystery of foreknowledge, and it seems to me that um, many people assume, and I think Calvinists and Molinists both assume, that God's foreknowledge is sort of that he sees a possible world and then decides to create it. Uh, Arminians don't believe that. We believe that God created this world and knew what would happen in it and reluctantly allowed the sin and evil and saw what he could do with it. So he did see what he could do with it. It was sort of a... Uh, that he could bring good out of it, but that doesn't in any way make the Holocaust good. No, no, exactly. In fact, I, I see in Calvinism, it seems to me, nothing can really be evil because everything is foreordained by God for his glory. At least that's what all of them that I quote in my book say. I don't know if you'll say that, but all of them that I quote in my book say that. Well, I, I think at, at least speaking for myself here, I think that Paul's very clear in Romans 8.28, for example, in saying not that all things are good. And there is a hyper-Calvinism. I've heard it. Oh, well, w receive that suffering that you're going through as good. And that's horrible pastoral care. No, don't receive it as good. Receive God as good and God's purposes ultimately as good. God is working it together for good. If it were good, he wouldn't have to work it together for good. Pastorally, Arminians say the same thing. Maybe the emphasis would be a little bit different. God can work this together for good if you let him. Boy, that puts even more on me when I'm dying of cancer. Give it up to God. God can bring something good out of this. But God didn't plan your cancer. Next, Next question. Next. <laughs> the best tweet of the night. I think I heard the cannons of Dort earlier tonight. Or maybe that was just Disneyland. Is this the <laughs> This is the Nephilim question. Yeah, yeah that's that right. The night. I knew okay. it was going to yeah. have to happen. Uh, one question that's come several different times in a couple different ways, and it might be a good question to uh, end on. Uh, is there a way in which we can just mix Calvinism and Arminianism together? Oh, boy. Is we, there, is I there know a, we're going to agree on this one. Yeah. Is there, no. no. This is easy. <laughs> This is like the Reese's commercial. Yeah. Well, can't we pick and choose, you know, the different parts that make sense or that seem to, uh, uh, to, to be the, the best side of our imagination of God? Can I take this? Please. Then, then, yeah, okay. oh, please. So You're good at students yeah. are always asking me this. Isn't there middle ground? I say Arminianism is the middle ground <laughs> between Pelagianism and Calvinism. You want the middle ground? Here it is. <laughs> It is on the way to Pelagianism. Uh, uh, I, I walked right into that. No, I couldn't agree more. This is, we don't disagree about everything, and I hope you're hearing that. This is, uh, yeah, we don't disagree about everything. We disagree about some important things, and on those important things, we disagree totally. Yeah. It's not as if we uh, are, we just have our side. If, you know, you, you need the Arminians to remind you about the importance of human responsibility and the Calvinists to remind you it's all of grace. That's an offense to both. Roger wants to say it's all of grace. I want to talk about human responsibility wherever the passages affirm human responsibility. We 
definitely talk about human responsibility in Reformed theology. But, but we give different answers to some very important questions. And it's just lazy to say you can, put, you can sort of just uh, ignore those questions and not decide about these questions and say that that is an actual position to hold. You can ignore it and say, I don't think this is an important issue and I'm just not going to work on it right now. But you can't say that is an actual position. Uh, uh, that, that's a... Yeah, there's no hybrid, really, of Arminianism and Calvinism. Um, there are things we agree on, like you said, but there's, there isn't a mixture on, on the important questions that divide us, right? But they don't have to divide us. I mean, I, th I hope you've gotten the sense tonight that Mike and I are friends. I wish we lived closer, because we'd go out and you'd have a beer and I'd have a Pepsi, right? <laughs> <laughs> you might have a shanty. <laughs> no, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> don't do that. Um, but we really like each other. I like Mike. Um, and, but, you know, I wouldn't go to a church he pastored. And he wouldn't go to one I pastor. Mm -mm. Yeah. These questions are too important for that. Let's give our appreciation to Dr. Horton and Dr. Olson for allowing us to listen in on their conversation. The White Horse Inn is a listener-supported broadcast. For more information about supporting our efforts, give us a call at 1-800-890-7556. That's 1-800-890-7556. You can also visit us online at whitehorsen.org. That's whitehorsen.org.